Today we're talking about the Joe's computer expert. He's someone who's probably had to evolve the most over the years as computer technology has advanced at exponential rates. Who is he? Mainframe. Let's talk about him. Thanks for watching JLS Comics. If you do like the video, hit the thumbs up and subscribe. I do upload videos just like this every week. Okay, let's jump into our story. Blaine Parker was born in Phoenix, Arizona. At 17 years old, Blaine enlisted in the United States Army, went through basic and graduated as Army Airborne. After two tours of duty, which included the last year of the Vietnam War, Blaine earned his Combat Infantryman's Badge. Blaine was then discharged, and now a civilian, he went to MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts on the GI Bill, and now with his new prestigious degree, Blaine found himself in Silicon Valley, California, making some big money with big tech. But being a desk jockey was boring to him, and so Blaine decided to again find himself in the company of a few good men. And to do so, he joined the U.S. Marine Corps and the 3rd Marine Division, where he was forward deployed to Asia and stationed at Camp Courtney in Okinawa, Japan. So Mainframe is a soldier and a Marine. And this badass guy, even though he was 10 years older than the rest of his class of trainees at this point, finished first at Paris Island. He really carved out a specialty for himself as he invented and developed technology for real-time C3, command control and communications, and battlefield management systems. He's also adept at hacking enemy systems, bypassing firewalls, and inserting viruses. For modern cyber warfare tactics, Mainframe is your guy. Blaine then joined the G.I. Joe team, officially taking on the codename Mainframe. According to Mark Belomo's Ultimate Guide to G.I. Joe, suggested names for him included Big Bite with a Y, Chip, and Relay before they all agreed Mainframe was the best name. And so now, with his new codename, Mainframe first appeared in late 1986 in the second issue of a miniseries called G.I. Joe and the Transformers, where he's helping to put an Autobot named Bumblebee back together with a cranky crankcase. In continuity, however, Mainframe first appeared in Larry Hama and Marvel Comics, a real American hero comic book series with issue number 57. In his debut issue, Mainframe is right on the splash page, working in the hangar deck of the USS Flag on Mars Industries' computer components that the team recovered from Sierra Gordo. In the next issue, Mainframe and Dusty headed to the Middle East to aid the Amir against a usurper named Colonel Sharif. They had to help Professor Gamal, a boy named Rashid, remember that name, and their forces intercept and capture tech from one of Sharif's convoys. As a favor for capturing the gear from the convoy, Gamal gave Mainframe and Dusty a BMW R75 motorcycle with a sidecar and assigned Rashid as their guide to their objective, terror drones. Mainframe said Rashid could hop in the sidecar with him, but Rashid replied, Now that I am a man, I will ride with a real soldier, not a fixer of computers. And he hopped on Dusty's seat. Ooh, burn. Rashid then guided them through the night desert, ending up at a series of oil tanks. And inside of the oil tanks were the hidden pterodromes. Mainframe said the trick might have worked, but they failed to hook up inlet and outlet pipes to fool their satellites. They broke into the pterodromes so that Mainframe could get to work. While Dusty and Rashid guarded the doors, Mainframe hooked his computer up to the central data bank. Rashid wanted to learn about Warcraft from Dusty, not the game Warcraft, but how to fight. In reply, Dusty said that the one he could really learn something from is Mainframe. And so Rashid again insulted Mainframe. He's like an old woman with books and such. Ooh, another burn. But Dusty said that Mainframe is who the mission is all about and encouraged Rashid to talk to Mainframe. Rashid watched as Mainframe worked his magic, patching in directly to the team at Fort Wadsworth. They'd gotten the blueprints for the pterodromes, but they needed the pterodrome master files on the computer to figure out exactly what these newly discovered installations were for. Then Mainframe had a PSA moment. Rashid was complaining that they trekked across the desert through bandit country to make a phone call? And Mainframe said, Learn to use your noodle, kid. Thinking is always better than fighting, and if you think hard enough, you can get out of most jams. And this would be proven with action right away. Colonel Sharif's elite guard burst in the front door. And Mainframe quickly threw his rifle on the ground and said, We give up! And then, fading fear, told the guards, I didn't come willingly. These two terrorists forced me. And then he collapsed to the floor. But it was all a trick. Mainframe grabbed one of the guards' boots and flipped him over and knocked out the second guy who was caught off guard. See? Thinking. Outside, more troops blocked off their exit. So Mainframe ran back inside with a wide-eyed Rashid, curious about what he was going to do. Mainframe went to the computer terminal and reprogrammed the Terradrome's firebat to launch and then circle back and strafe the perimeter of the drome. So the firebat lined up for a ground attack, destroying an entire armored column with its 25mm twin coaxial cannons, air-to-surface condor bombs, and high-drag Mark 38 snake eye guided bombs. Inside, with a grin on his face, Mainframe scooped up his M16 and said, This is our chance! Let's go! And, knowing the odds that still remained, leaned over to Dusty and said, What? You want to live forever? 
And as the sun came up over the dunes once more, the trio were victorious. Dusty rode them back out on the motorcycle while Mainframe took the time to catch some sleep. And Rashid was impressed. Dusty simply said, He's an old campaigner and he doesn't need to prove himself to anyone. He just gets the job done and to blazes what anyone else thinks because a soldier only wins by surviving. Mainframe showed up again a few issues later, now at the Joe's base in Utah. Hawk flew in from San Francisco on top secret orders for a priority mission. At three levels below ground, he found Mainframe, who told him that on a recent Air Force space mission, their new sensors detected widespread ultra-low frequency transmissions. He picked up the launch of a rocket from Cobra Island, and Payload told Mainframe and Hawk that Cobra were launching to intercept the Air Force shuttle. You see, if Air Force got their sensors working, they'd discover what Cobra was up to, so they couldn't have it. Later, Dr. Mindbender created the stiletto pilot Star Viper that he tasked with sneaking onto the Joe's base and stealing the black box from the USS Defiant. At the pit, Mainframe was working on this very thing. He pulled what he called the ultimate black box out of the bottom of the space shuttle, but put it back when he was done with the data link. This is what Star Viper stole, and is what Mindbender used as leverage to force the Joes to aid him in Serpentor against Cobra Commander during the upcoming civil war on Cobra Island. On his way out, Star Viper ran into Flint and LJ getting it on and so Flint smashed the alarm and the first thing Mainframe did when he heard the alarm was check for the black box which he discovered was now gone. For the inevitable Cobra Civil War that came right after this, Mainframe was stationed on the USS flag with the ops team along with Hawk, Flint, and Lady J. Mainframe was also seen in the Action Force European mission story called War Beneath the Waves. He was part of the team on a whale in the Atlantic Ocean off the northwest coast of Africa where he was kidnapped by Cobra along with a tax tactical analysis computer system device. Falcon and Lifeline saw Mainframe's broadcast for help just as Cobra Eels and a Hydro Viper attacked them and then the video cut out. Right below their feet, under the water, was a Cobra underwater base where they were being held captive and they tried to escape even as the service team dove to find them. Mainframe walked into the command center and tried to walk off with the tax, but Cobra Commander slapped him with a backhand. And Mainframe grabbed the tax, and when Cobra Commander tried to punch Mainframe, he used the device to block the punch, and it ended up being Cobra Commander who shattered the device. Mainframe was also on Tunnel Rat's team with Crazy Legs, Hit and Run, and Fast Draw as they snuck through an empty oil pipeline trying to reclaim an oil terminal in the Arabian Gulf that Cobra had taken over for a story called Knights in Armor. Mainframe was then on an extended mission where he was in the sewers of New York with Dial Tone and CoverGirl. They were underground and just across the street from the Cobra Consulate building, eavesdropping on the consulate. They had an old buddy named Sarge who now ran a newsstand full of Marvel comics, and so that's whose place they set up right under. Their bugs were discovered and it was their turn to bug out. Mainframe was then part of a special mission, a secret recon op over Cobra Island to find out what their massive airlift operation was about. Mainframe was in a C-130 while a Sky Striker, an X-30, and an X-19 flew flanking flight plans with different angles of attack. The Herc would jam Cobra's radars and clutter up the screen with their big cross-section and big signal. The situation at the airspace quickly degraded and an all-out dogfight erupted. Mainframe had to crank up the radar and ECM jamming across the entire spectrum. And a stiletto buzzed the C-130 and so Mainframe dumped a bunch of aerial mines out the back. Mainframe made a quick cameo in issue 115 where he was hanging out with LJ on the USS flag where Slipstream and Ghost, uh, Captain Jeffries, whatever his name is, had just gotten back from the recon mission over Benzene and crashed right onto the flight deck. Issue 118 is cool because Rashid shows up again to help out Shuckles who had been helping Destro, Zartan, and Billy Kessler escape death and attack the Night Creepers headquarters in Zurich, Switzerland. He said that years ago he was out in the desert with two Joes and one of them sparked his interest in computers, meaning mainframe. Rashid used a Night Creeper computer to hack into a bank system and install a virus to delete a $10 million account belonging to Cobra Commander, and Destro used this proof of action as leverage to get Cobra Commander to release the Baroness and cancel the bounty he had on Destro. So Mainframe's action years ago had a downstream positive effect. Then Mainframe was at White Sands Proving Grounds to test out a kinetic energy weapon, a real gun mounted on a converted battle wagon. Mainframe was in the command bunker with Dial Tone, Psych Out, and Dr. Zeitgeist, the inventor of the weapon. Later, Cobra had again taken over the town of Millville that Joe set up outside of and below town. Hawk called Mainframe to activate their transdimensional warp communicator, and he fired the signal right at Cybertron to call the Autobots back to Earth to help against Cobra and Megatron. So Mainframe was the one to alert Optimus Prime and Bumblebee that the Decepticons were back. 
And so he remained with the team on active duty until the team was stood down and the pit decommissioned in 1994. When the team was reinstated for Josh Blaylock's Volume 2 of G.I. Joe through Image and Devil's Do, Mainframe was in Seattle, Washington when he got the call to be reactivated. In the last issue of G.I. Joe Frontline, issue 18, Mainframe had a hilarious scene where he's hacking into extensive enterprises and comparing his hacking skills to Snake Eyes, then doing a crane stance while Firewall comes in and quickly leaves when she sees what he's doing. As he said to himself, he needs to get out more. During the war on Cobra Island with Serpentor and The Coil, Mercer paired Mainframe up with Flash to get inside an EMP tower to plant explosives. They did this, but they were surrounded by Coil troops. Flash said, mission accomplished, and the tower blew up with them inside. In his central data desk file, General Colton lists Mainframe's status as killed MIA. And at the end, a very apropos death for my friend, General Colton says, sacrificing himself humbly, without fanfare, behind the scenes, doing heroic work that benefited countless others, just as he would have wanted it. At some point in the past, Mainframe was the one directing Leatherneck, Dial Tone, Claymore, and Wetsuit's operation during Special Missions Brazil. They were all on reserve status technically, and so this hadn't come from the top. The team was in Brazil, deep in the Amazon jungle, way up Rio Negro, plenty of explosives at a small dock facility. It turns out the facility was run by a drug kingpin named Headman and his headhunters. That place was destroyed, and this mission was a cooperative operation with the Brazilian government, but Headman ended up getting away. Later in the issue, a video file that Mainframe made before his death turned up in Joe headquarters, now called The Rock, with Mainframe using a screen name Texas Instruments 58. Spark played the video file for General Colton, and in the video, Mainframe said that they were operating on foreign soil and he'd take the fall for it if the follow-up op went south. Firewall then showed up to help with a helmet that looks like she borrowed it right from Mainframe's locker. They went to meet up with someone. Guess who? It's Rashid again. Mainframe's friend from his first mission with the Joes. They found out that Mr. Asakainen, an aide to the ambassador, was leaking DEA information from the embassy to cause a scandal and to get more money and power from Headman for himself. In Chuck Dixon's IDW continuity, Mainframe was alive and well and in the field with Team Alpha on an op near the Black Sea. Some local mafia soldiers blew up Mainframe's rib with a surplus Soviet RPG and Mainframe wound up in the hospital for months with a cast on his leg, listening to iTunes and reading comic books. The doctor told Mainframe that he had taken four ounces of shrapnel, got a concussion, busted his knee and hip, broke four ribs, and he had to reinflate Mainframe's lungs twice. Scarlet brought him a laptop though so he could keep working. This was before they knew about Cobra because this was a new continuity and it was Mainframe's bedridden status that allowed him to dig deep into the data and discover Cobra. Mainframe then went rogue and started following the trail on his own. He holed up in South Beach in Miami using an anagram of his government name, Lane B. Crapier. But when the Joes breached, they found it empty and Mainframe called Scarlet to say it was all on purpose to pull them down the trail with him and even threw in a cool Kobayashi Maru reference. During this continuity's G.I. Joe Civil War, Mainframe was making out with Scarlet and they even dated for a brief minute. Later, Mainframe and Scarlet were in charge of the Special Missions Force. In the first issue, he was in Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean with the team, working on his Snake Hunter program. Mainframe's tech team would identify targets for the ground forces to then go after. In one issue, he was operating from an E3 Century AWACS plane above Europe, where he was working with a female dial tone, Light Horse Spreadsheet, and the rest of the team to counter-hack an evil hacker named Error 404. Arrow 404 had sent a couple drones to attack a commercial jetliner with an EMP weapon. So then Mainframe had a really cool moment as he jumped out of his plane with a Skevel suit, a Skyborne capable evac lift suit. It was a wingsuit that made him look like a flying snake eyes. And he anchored himself to the jet's wing and then took out the drones with a grenade launcher. Once Larry Hama picked the ARAH series back up, Mainframe re-upped with the Hamaverse. In fact, he's one of the first few people that Duke called right after Roadblock. He told Mainframe that Cobra had an open hit order out on all of them, just as Mainframe was attacked. And Mainframe took out his assailant with a microwave beam. He was then with the team who used an old truck like a Trojan horse where he tossed Duke a shotgun and then took out a televiper at the front gate as the newly reformed team assaulted Silent Castle. Mainframe blasted away with handguns akimbo. Their mission was to have Mainframe download files to his laptop and get them back to the Pentagon and it worked. It exposed Cobra's attempts at a takeover and even as NSA continued to review the documents, Cobra's defense contracts were all cancelled. 
Mainframe then spent most of his time in the command center of the pit. He was also in charge of getting all troops and equipment undercover or underground before any satellite flyovers. In fact, he met up with an inbound Herc for this very reason, getting it on the lift quickly as it was lowered into the pit. When they had Baroness in the brig, she was able to stick a transmitter from her chest sigil on the back of Mainframe's helmet that she spoofed their systems with. Mainframe then went to the Chrysler building in Manhattan to help General Colton out with recalibrating his SDI laser. In fact, he wrote all the lines of code that would get its targeting back on point. This is when Firefly and Crystal Ball would attack though, and so as the laser came back online, Joe, Jane, and Mainframe had to lock and load for an incoming attack. The cover of issue 169 shows Firefly's hands around Mainframe's neck as they crash through a window high above the city. That's not what happened in the story though. He was there at the elevator when Firefly shot Joe, and as Mainframe later read the after-action report, he laughed out loud as he reviewed the comments about Jane taking down Crystal Ball and forcing him to shut off the detonator, saving the hostages. Then Mainframe was with the team at Comic-Con in San Diego as they hunted down the Crytron nuclear trigger device on a tip from Destro. Mainframe, Duke, and Lift Ticket set up next to a hotel rooftop pool across from the convention center with the Tomahawk set down right on the pool deck. He then helped Duke debrief the team and get the intel on Margarita Shiro, aka Pale Peony, and Arashikage trained Yakuza princess. Mainframe is the one who figured out where the nuclear device and the Crytron trigger ended up by intercepting radio transmissions and freight manifests. Mainframe stayed in the pit with Falcon and Psych out during the Robert Graves rescue op, commanding and monitoring all activity right from there. Mainframe is the one who figured out where the terror drone was that the hostages were being held at down in Sierra Gordo. He was there at the pit when Cobra invaded and helped round up the troopers and vipers they captured, and he hacked into the televipers helmet and reset their IFF codes. Mainframe was then out on the range for the testing of their big mech weapon, supervising drone vehicle controllers, stealer, armadillo, and cross country from the back of the APC. Back inside the pit, Mainframe detected a glitch in the system as the resurrected Serpentor started hacking their systems. He later oversaw Joystick, who was piloting an MQ-9 Reaper drone over CoverGirl's AO and Shazadar. And then for the Sean Collins rescue op during Snake Hunt, Mainframe was in the command suburban for the trip to Springfield. And from there, he laid into Cobra with his M4. G.I. Joe Yearbook 2 previewed upcoming G.I. Joes for the new season of the hit animated series, and it includes an interesting description of Mainframe saying, He's one of the oldest Joes. He was in Vietnam, discharged, became a computer expert. He's not happy being just the Joes computer expert. He wants to be in combat more, but because of his age, the only way they take him is as a computer expert. So Mainframe debuted with Season 2 of Sunbow's G.I. Joe animated series, appearing in all five parts of the season opening Arise Serpentor, Arise event. He was voiced by Patrick Penny, the same actor who voiced Wolverine in the short-lived Pride of the X-Men, and by short-lived I mean there was just the one pilot episode. In the event, Mainframe was with Beachhead guarding the tomb of Dracula, Vlad Tepish, and even had to hide out in his coffin. In computer complications, Zorana broke into the base disguised as Sergeant Carol Weedler. When Mainframe saw Carol, he fell hard for her. She tried to kill him, but it backfired and he ended up saving her instead. He took her to the Eat at Joe's diner for an NSA date. Who was their waiter? Zartan, of course. Mainframe had to fix some submarines, and so while he was working, Zorana kept trying to kill him, but when he turned around, it just kept being the tool that he needed. Then, Zorana pretended she was going to sleep with him, so he killed the lights, and fake Carol ended up zapping Mainframe in the darkness. Duty comes first, unfortunately, she said to him as he lay unconscious on the floor. Zartan and the Dreadnoughts burst in, and Zartan threw a bomb on Mainframe, and later Zorana took over a four-wheeler and grabbed the bomb and rode off with it. She really did like Mainframe, that part wasn't an act. Mainframe liked her too, and we saw him hide Zorana from the rest of the Joes while they were chasing the Saboteur. In Cobrathon, he was on the team to track down Cobra computer hackers, and he had to disable their computers before the Cobrathon finished and Sci-Fi and Lifeline were killed. In Glamour Girls, Mainframe was on the team investigating the disappearance of those models. In Gray Hairs and Growing Pains, Mainframe met up with the team on an LCV recon sled as they had to investigate the ageless care process at a spa. Mainframe and Dialtone had to interview a football player named Brett Tinker. Mainframe caught the ball and said, hey, my first pro interception. <laughs> At the spa, Mindbender's treatment turned Mainframe and the team into kids. And it ended up being Zorana, who still liked Mainframe, who helped them out. In Joe's Night Out, Mainframe was helping out a guy named Dr. Mullaney with his nitrogen fuel project. He then had to help out after Club Open Air was launched into space by Serpentor. In the Into Your Tent episode, Mainframe was playing a video game that he made. Mainframe was also in G.I. Joe the movie, but he really didn't say much. Mainframe was also featured in the book G.I. Joe Operation Starfight with art by Earl Norum. 
NASA was launching a new space station from Cape Canaveral, and so Cobra attacked the launch facilities with Vipers, so Mainframe was one of the team to respond. In the firefight, the Joes climbed the service structure next to the rocket when a bullet tore through Mainframe's sleeve, which startled him so much he almost fell down and pancaked on the concrete. They then engaged Cobra in the cockpit of the space shuttle, and Roadblock tossed the last Viper out as the shuttle was launched. I think we're going for a ride, Mainframe said, and the story ended with them all smiling in a near-Earth orbit. Mainframe's V1 action figure hit toy shelves and pegs in the spring of 1986, which came with his backpack and radio, but curiously, for an infantryman and marine who was effective enough to earn a badge, no weapons. A couple months later, during the summer of 86, Mainframe was released in a Toys R Us exclusive along with wetsuit, dial tone, claymore, and leatherneck as part of the Special Missions Brazil set that also included a cassette tape. In 2008, Mainframe came carded with Beachhead in a comic book reprint of ARAH issue 11 for a two-pack. Well, it is Mainframe, but here he's called a data frame. There's also a Creo version of Mainframe that was exclusive to the TRU Terror Drone set. You can see him right on the cover of the box running and gunning during a firefight with a Serpentor who's floating around in his air chariot. In 2011, Mainframe was also part of the Mission Brazil 2 set that was exclusive to the Jocon that year in Orlando, Florida. And so there you have it, the story of Mainframe. That's a wrap on this one, my friends. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll be one of the first to know when I upload videos just like this each and every week. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.